Greetings, welcome to the 2024 series of Transforming Assessment Webinars. Uh, today's session is on the shape of cheating to come from Sean and Kane, both from Macquarie University in Australia. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself and acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the country on which you are on, you are welcome to do that via the text chat now. So um, in Australia and New Zealand, this is a relatively uh, common thing these days to do. Um, if you're international, you may have an equivalent uh, tradition, as it were, in your location. So, Kane, would you like to begin? Thanks, Matt. Um, he's done the introductions. My name is Kane Murdoch. Um, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Sean Lehman. And we're talking about the shape of cheating to come. But as with most things, you know, looking into the future, it helps if you look to the past a little bit, not too far. Even earlier today, the work we're doing today and what how that informs what we do tomorrow. Um, so I want to start out by saying something a little bit controversial. Um, there is a truth that most of us will, I understand it, but many don't in higher education, but we don't wish to recognise nearly any student can cheat depending on a few things. One is their ability to learn. The second is their willingness to learn. And the third, and this one is in our control, the first two are not, our willingness to secure our assessments or not. Adding an overlay of kind of moral judgment that we often do in these spaces in cheating and plagiarism, things like this, it's unhelpful at best and it's probably delusionary at worst. So there's a number of ways that people wish to explain cheating. There's competing discourses and, you know, this one will hold sway for a little while and that one will hold sway for a, a range of reasons onwards. In our view, the current dominant discourse is the academic integrity discourse. In short, you know, if students cheat, it's viewed as a lack of education around scholarly norms. And to us, this is part of the waxing and waning between highly punitive approaches and education focused approaches. The Trisha Bertram Glant, she identified this more than 15 years ago. And we agree with, um, I would say, the leading assessment security scholars, Phil Dawson, that one approach without the other is doomed. We, it, won't be, it won't succeed. And history supports our take on this. It's also entirely reasonable and accurate to say that existing strategic approaches have comprehensively failed. We need to admit that before we can move forward. And another way to say this is to say that neither of the approaches taken by higher ed to dealing with the cheating problem are enough. It's not that one worked for a little while and the other one will have worked for a little while and then they fade. Neither of them ever worked. But in, in fact, they're really doomed to failure unless they're used in concert across whole cohorts and courses. So for the purposes of this talk, we can take academic integrity to mean inculcating positive values and ethical scholarship in students and assessment security to mean detecting and stopping those who wish to cheat. So, but we should also note that students and technologies exposed our failings years ago it, it's highly demonstrable that it was broken a decade ago and there is other history to show that it's been broken for much longer than that just technology moves on so we catch up briefly and then it outshoots us again so of course ai is our new moral panic and that has everyone running around in circles. But the only substantive difference now is that deni the deniability that much of higher ed engaged in is no longer plausible. That's basically where we stand. That's why there's a shift in the rhetoric. That's why there's a shift in how we're looking at the problem, because we know it is a problem. And we can't deny it anymore. So you'll notice the tense in this slide. People have told us that, you know, oh, has contract cheating died because of AI? And the answer is no, no, it hasn't. We haven't seen any 
notable difference in our workload in the stuff that we're finding. So this is not a yesterday problem. It's a today problem under which AI and chatbots and anything else out there has been stacked. So earlier strategies, they focus primarily on content and context in order to secure assessments. Like Turnitin is the classic example, it's the headline example of this. If only we look at content more closely or we divine it, we hold a stick over it and throw tea leaves and hope to work out how the cheating has happened. But that's primarily based on the idea that there's no one better to make judgments on content than academic experts. And that is true. Academic experts absolutely are the people to make judgments on content. But what the last 15 years of academics looking into contract cheating have showed us is that you can stare at content all day long and you won't see very much at all. So just as generations change, technology changes and people adapt to new technology, the na nature of cheating has changed, but also the nature of detection. So students self-report cheating much higher rates than universities detect that same cheating. And the question we should be asking ourselves is why higher ed has only detected a fraction of it until now. So putting aside any cynical motives that universities may have in not finding cheating, most unis are missing the pieces of the puzzle that would enable them to take a strategic approach to the issue. And among these missing pieces are efficient and effective procedures for handling cheating. It's effectively wasted resources. Misguided ideas around what cheating actually looks like. Copy and paste plagiarism isn't cheating in our view for example. And the third thing that's missing is that is tools that can efficiently and effectively detect cheating. So another way to put this, Sean, if you could click, um, is that probably 20 or more years ago, a chain broke and that chain was called assessment validity. If you, as the academic expert in your subject, you can't ensure, ensure who's completing your assessments, you therefore cannot assure yourself or anyone else that learning has actually occurred. That must mean your assessment is invalid. And the fact that we are still debating effective strategies for dealing with this ongoing problem presents severe risks for higher education. I'm sure we're all perfectly aware of that. But that's how we view our role. We don't view our role as cops. Indeed, I would take some offense at that. We view our role as risk identification and mitigation. So before we move on, let me be clear, we're not saying that you as educators shouldn't trust your students. And you'll see why I'm saying this in a moment. But instead, what we're saying is that assuring degrees that are awarded by higher ed with nothing but trust is amateurish and naive. Individual academics attempting to be every link in the chain is like a bad Jamie Oliver episode. It's a recipe for failure. So with the broken chain metaphor established, you'll have to forgive me that one. We want to spend the rest of this talk discussing effective links that can be added to strengthen the chain relatively easily and cheaply, because as we know, there is no magic money tree and there is no horde of horses carrying bags of cash over the hill. That's not going to happen. So we have to be smarter with what we have. So I'm going to attempt to walk you through this next slide. There's quite a bit here. Um, my PowerPoint version actually animated it, so it was a bit easier to do, but I'll talk you through it. So the pyramid, the triangle you see in the middle there, you can take that to encapsulate all of the students in a given institution. On the left-hand side, we have student attitudes, and these attitudes can shift up or down depending on circumstances, such as students' ability to learn, their confidence, their willingness to learn. And really those things can ebb and flow. So we have at the bottom, we have champion students, students who champion academic integrity. And these students who would essentially never consider necessarily cheating, they could, they could. And I think that's what COVID showed is that those students aren't stuck to the bottom, but typically they'll sit down there and at the top, you'll see a category labeled criminal. Now, I'll qualify this. We are not saying that students 
are the criminals. What we are saying is that the activities that they engage in bring them closer to criminal elements, criminal activities, such as visa fraud, things like this, along those lines. Indeed, contract cheating. Contract cheating provision is a crime in Australia. And so that's what we mean by criminal. And as you can see on the left, the students down at the bottom, there's a very low risk associated with those students. And the students at the top, there's a much, much higher risk. Now, on the right-hand side, you see institutional strategies and responses to the varying student positions. So you'll see support and advise. These are classic academic integrity activities. It's good that we do them. We should keep doing them and do them better. And at the top, we have direction and compulsion. So this is when a student is you know, detected or caught doing something really very severe. And the university effectively doesn't have too many choices and they need to lower that risk. So if a student has contract cheated an entire degree, which is definitely not unknown in our experience, um, this, the university usually doesn't have too many choices. But I'm going to focus on the middle ground here and talk about the monitor section, because that's really what the second half of this talk is about. Um, it's the area where we have the ability to actually start looking closely, closely observing activities that students undertake. Now, for a lot of people, that probably kind of jumped up and screamed surveillance. And I have heard a lot of people crying surveillance. And I think those people usually, in my experience, have probably read Discipline and Punish a few too many times. And they wake up with night sweats about the thought of turning it in surveilling students, which we think is nonsense. But we actually think we desperately need more monitoring of students. It's actually almost the total absence of monitoring, which has led to a um, deluge of cheating. Um, so for those opposed to monitoring, please keep making your argument. Absolutely. We think it's important that students aren't treated like criminals. But screeching that surveillance at any form of close observation through technology, it's pretty unhelpful. But at worst, it's a real it's a real abrogation of our collective responsibilities to society to assure the qualities of our graduates. That's the one number one reason why universities exist, not research. Research couldn't exist without those students coming through the door and those degrees holding and maintaining their value. So to be fair, just to acknowledge, we would also add that hyper punitive surveillance approaches exemplified by racist and ableist AI online exam proctoring. That's also failed. We entirely agree that students, uh, sorry, technologies such as online exam proctoring should be rejected for the reason that not only do they fail on their own merits, they don't really do at all well what they purport to do, but more, most importantly, they damage a student's ability to demonstrate their learning. So we think there's a middle ground, which has remained pretty unexplored, and it kind of charts the space between where over assessment security and academic integrity overlap. It may be a fourth space. I'll have to have a talk with someone about that one day. I'll hand over to Sean briefly. Yeah, so in, in, in thinking about what this fourth space and the, and the kind of middle ground looks like, we think through a few years of work in this space, we've really precipitated out of our work a framework that is beginning to work well, but it does tend to hit a particular obstacle that we're going to talk about overcoming. So basically the first key thing here, obviously, is the whole hashtag make it someone's job. You need a central team with expertise. Um, and uniting them around a framework helps. The framework we've found that works well for us is sort of a three-pillared framework um, that revolves around the idea of non-learning analytics, which I'll unpack a little bit more in a minute. Um, the case history that we get from uh, uh, cases that are carried through 
the our, our system in terms of investigating cheating cases and courageous conversations and what we learn from them. They all need to feed into each other. Courageous conversations are really important because they incentivize students being honest with us, showing us their integrity by talking to us about their mistakes and what's happened. We learn from those things. And basically through them describing their behaviors to us and what happened, we're better able to tune what I'm calling here non-learning analytics that allow us to identify behaviors. From there, that feeds into more identif uh, identifications of cases, which builds a case history and around and around it, it goes. The typical trouble that most institutions face here is that getting funding for, for enough people to do this, at least in a fairly old fashioned manual way is a really big challenge because senior leaders and in institutions need to be convinced of the scale of cheating with hard data, which means case histories. But in order to resource a response that would give them that case history, uh, you know, you can see here we're, we're falling into a catch 22, right? So you can't get the case history without the funding and you can't get the funding without the case history. So what you really need is a way to ramp up what you can do with relatively few people. And we've had quite a bit of success with that. So that brings us onto the idea of non-learning analytics, which is really sitting at, uh, you know, those three pillars are all important, but this one is really the, the, the breakthrough one that we've been able to leverage to really scale up what we do. <clears throat> so the key thing here is that, you know, while human power isn't necessarily scalable in terms of what they can do manually, you know, data and data analysis is scalable, data is searchable. Um, looking at data efficiently is cheaper than spending time on academics and professional staff. And, you know, we're happy to be corrected on it, but as far as we know, through our non-learning analytics approach, we probably come closest to seeing the actual real scale of commercial contract cheating in higher ed, because we've been able to define it pretty well and identify it with a pretty high level of accuracy through this um, way of looking at things. So basically, while learning analytics, everyone will be familiar with the idea of learning analytics, you probably have learning analytics teams who analyze your um, learning systems and look at the way students are engaging in their subjects. It's kind of the flip side of the coin of that. So non-learning analytics gives us an insight into how people enrolled in our courses are demonstrably not learning and uh, whether that's via collusion with other students or more concerningly through mass commercial contract cheating. So we're able to identify through looking at behaviors that we've learned about through case histories and admissions in courageous conversations, how to identify key bits of data that tell us where things are going wrong. And from there, as I'll explain a little bit further on, those pieces of data then give us new pieces of data and it becomes a self uh, perpetuating sort of process. So I'll hand back to Kane here. So, sorry, I've gone one too far. Um, so, when we talk about this as an ongoing concern, like it's a day-to-day -day work concern for us. And we talked about the scale of the issue. So there have been earlier glimpses into the industry, but as it turns out, that's kind of all they were at the time. So at the time this headline occurred, that reflected work that I did at a previous institution. At the time, finding 170 students in a cluster in one subject engaged in contract cheating. It felt like a big step, a big kind of door opens and you go into another room moment. But it also presented a problem after that. It presented a needle in the haystack problem. And I, you might find things in that subject, but what about all the others? You can follow the ends of those students, but how do you find others repeatedly? And that's where Wiru comes in. And I'll hand back to Sean. Okay, so <clears throat> basically, uh, so Wiru for context here, especially for those of you who are overseas, I'm a Noongar man. Um, Wiru is a Noongar word, meaning it's a type of owl. And I've spent a lot of my time looking at data and the image of an owl with big eyes looking at data appears to me. So the, the, the software tools and, and framework I've developed for working in this space scalably, I've called Wiru. What Wiru is, is probably the first dedicated non-learning analytics tool set that's capable of doing a lot of different things. So case building, detection, um, and really importantly too, for thinking about that regulation pyramid, providing objective information about assessment security and the impacts of assessment security changes. So being able to actually measure 
after you've changed assessment in a particular subject, whether the rate of risk behaviours went down or not is something we can do with Wiru. So Wiru is focused on responding to really one of the most dominant uh, commercial contract cheating models, which involves students handing over their user credentials to cheating providers. Um, it happens a lot more often than people think. Um, and uh, the way Wiru does this is it essentially takes in data from your learning management system. So we're talking here about Moodle or Canvas or Blackboard, whatever your institution is working with. Um, when students are interacting with their learning management system, every interaction is logged somewhere, essentially. And those logs contain details of time that things happened. They can contain details of what was accessed. So lecture slides, a quiz task was done, a submission was made to turn it in, this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and importantly, IP address information too, which can give you information about where the user was um, whether they were using a VPN, all kinds of other different information. So Wiru ingests that information um, along with Turnitin authorship, so document metadata if it's available too, and is able to do subject level risk assessment, identifying students at risk, and deep dive on individual students where, where needed to produce reports. Um, we've been able to get to a point now where it's quite easy to use. I've got a GUI developed for this now. Um, with very simple options. Um, you essentially just tell it what kind of analysis you want, uh, what your risk tolerances are, and upload some key data, and away it goes. Um, it can run on a normal laptop. Um, it doesn't need to work off in a server somewhere. It's not a cloud-based computing thing. It just runs on your machine. Um, and by doing that, it respects privacy, which is really important. So there's no student data pinging backwards and forwards over the uh, over the internet and into cloud storage while this is happening. It just happens locally on the investigator's machine. Um, can take in uh, multiple data sets. So as I said, learning management system logs and turn it in authorship reports. It's also quite smart about the logs it takes in. So let's say you investigate a student in class X um, and then a month later, you need to investigate another student who is in class X. It'll actually have banked the subject learning management system data for class X. So you don't need to go and download it again out of your learning management system, saves heaps of time. Um, and also does some other clever things like where there's IP address information, checks the IP address information with multiple reputable checking services, aggregates that data, cross checks it for reliability and, and does other things that you want to do just to make sure that you're handling your case as fairly as possible. Um, in terms of the outputs you get from it, there are a few different ones. Um, one of the main outputs you can get is a network visualization. So this is if you're, um, uh, so let's say you've analyzed um, a cohort. This is where you would get a network visualization. What you're seeing on the screen right now, um, each blue dot would be a student and each connection between the blue dots um, <clears throat> is uh, where the students share an IP address. We exclude the campus from this analysis. So, you know, they're, 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 we're not picking up connections here that are based on students on the campus. We anticipate that they might exist. And what you're seeing on the screen here, we characterize as quite minimal risk. You can see little duos and trios and connections of students there. That's really nothing to worry about. They're probably study groups, people meeting up at the local library, that kind of thing. So we can tell quite quickly that there's probably no subject level issue with this particular subject that involves a commercial cheating provider servicing heaps of students. Uh, it just tends not to look like this. Um, on the other hand though, uh, if we pull out something like this from our analysis, then that's telling us that there's probably a pretty serious issue going on. Um, where you see lots of connections like this, it's evidence that the same few IP addresses are doing lots of interactions in the learning management system for multiple students and signifies usually that a commercial cheating provider is probably recommending to their customer slash students that they take this subject because they can efficiently cheat their way through it. Um, so in terms of feeding back up into assessment security, this is where Wiru operates beyond the level of case management and things. If you were to identify something like this for a subject, you would of course want to feed that back to the relevant people who uh, are involved in assessment design there, because that is a, that's a really key indicator that assessment security and thus validity in that subject is low. So Wiru does operates at a few different levels there. Um, 
In addition to um, that network type analysis at the cohort level, WIRU also does a lot of other types of analysis. Um, so it interrogates the non-learning analytics of all the students in the particular subject and looks at behaviours exhibited by individual students. So for example, this student here and this student here have a, an assessment submitted by a user in Kenya. And if any of us know anything about contract cheating uh, industry, we'll know that seeing Kenya is probably concerning. Um, and it also looks at behaviours among students like the shared IP addresses we were just uh, looking at. So in doing this, Wiru generates risk scores for the students who are in the class. And that allows you to quickly identify A, whether you've got a collection of students at risk, and B, do you have an unusually high number of students at high risk in a subject? Because that can also tell you something interesting about assessment security. The other cool thing about looking at data in this way is that Non-learning analytics kind of is a self-growing framework once you start using it. Um, here, you've got a figure on the screen where on the left side, we've got um, assessment focus percent. So each blue dot there is a student. What we mean here is what percentage of their interactions with the learning management system were focused on assessment as opposed to accessing general learning materials or something like that. And then along the bottom axis there, you've got risk score. You'll note the risk score only goes up to five at that time. This is just because this is older data. My, my risk scoring system involves over a dozen non-learning analytic risk points at, the, at this stage. But <clears throat> what you're seeing here is an analysis I did where I had a bit of a look, interrogated the data that came out in, you know, quite useful summary data spreadsheets that we produces. And I was curious as to whether there might be a relationship between the assessment focus and the risk score based on the five risk points I was looking at at that time. And I found here um, that there was a pretty strong positive relationship between risk score um, based on other non-learning analytics behaviors. So things like multiple countries being active in their um, logs and the assessment percentage focus. And that's really what you would expect, right? If somebody's paying a third party to carry out an assessment, uh, carry out their assessment for them in a subject to complete the subject for them, that third party wants to do it as efficiently as possible. Um, they don't need to engage in all the learning materials. They probably already have access to them, especially if they're helping multiple students. So through looking at the non-learning analytics here, I identified a new non-learning analytic which is high percentage assessment focus that I could then work into the risk scoring system moving forward. So this non-learning analytics uh, approach, uh, approach is self-amplifying for want of a better term. So they help you learn what cheating behaviors look like and that in turn makes you better at detection. And then based on what you detect, you can look for new patterns. Um, in terms of individual deep analysis, so let's say we've done a cohort level analysis and we've identified that there's five or six students in a subject who have a lot of risk points going on. <clears throat> the next thing we would want to do is try and decide whether um, a case should be initiated to be brought against the to the student, raise the concerns with them, ask them about uh, whether they are willing to admit to mistakes and so on as a courageous conversation. <clears throat> to do that, we do what we call an individual deep dive analysis. So importantly here, um, traditional case management models in, in academic integrity would probably, um, if you had a tip off, for example, that students in class X had, um, had contract cheated, probably the student would only be investigated in subject X. Um, in our experience, having looked at a lot of these cases, it's unusual that a student who has engaged in commercial contract cheating has only done it in one subject. It's more often than not more widespread than that. So what Wiru does is takes all of the subjects the student has participated in, potentially over years, um, and then goes about analyzing their behaviors in them longitudinally, and also um, uh, across multiple subjects in the same study term. And that's really important too. Um, the whole One of the issues with relying on academics to pick up where contract cheating has happened, so markers, for example, is they can't actually see what's going on in multiple subjects. Whereas I might be able to have a look at two subjects a student has participated in in the same study session and identify using non-learning analytics that, hey, hang on here, it looks like actually two completely different sets of users have been active in these two subjects despite them happening in the same semester. 
right? So that's not at all something someone can identify when they're working at just a single subject level. Keynes uh, moved us across to a really great slide here too that shows some of the power of a longitudinal non-learning analytics analysis. So here we're looking at um, a student's engagement with subjects um, over a period of years. Um, the subjects aren't there just because they don't need to be there, but basically what we've got, uh, the bottom access if it was access if it was populated would be the subjects they've participated in arranged chronologically by the earliest access in the LMS. The blue line there is how engaged they were with the uh, LMS for that subject there. So how often were they clicking on that subject? How many clicks did it take to complete the subject? And the red line is the average for that subject. So you can see for about half of their history, they're tracking pretty close to the rest of their classmates in terms of their engagement. But in the middle there, something happened. Clearly we can see there's a sharp drop in their engagement relative to other students. And as it happens, in looking at other data in, the, uh, for, in this particular matter, it emerges that they've been engaging commercial contract cheating providers quite heavily from that point onward, and that those cheating providers are acting as efficiently as possible to complete subjects. So this in turn helps to identify yet another non-learning analytic that can be incorporated into analyses, which is very low engagement relative to the cohort. So again, it's another example of how these things bootstrap and also allow us to build a really good holistic longitudinal picture of what's gone on with a student's interactions with the institution. In this instance, something quite regrettable has happened about halfway through. Um, <clears throat> and that's important to know. If the student wants to have a courageous conversation and talk about what's happened, the institution may well learn something very important uh, about what led the student down that path, which is really important to know. I'll actually click on from that one. Yeah. <laughs> and the last and definitely not least output you get from, from an, a non-learning analytics analysis with Wiru, if you're doing an individual deep dive, <clears throat> is you actually have outputted complete pretty much investigation reports. So you can have user-defined templates for your investigation report documentation or courageous conversation letter documentation. In our case, we use both in our procedures. Um, and what comes out of this, so, you know, doing that, uh, that deep dive analysis I was just talking about, going from your raw data to uh, a 90% complete report like this um, takes, uh, you know, minutes, a couple of minutes maybe. And from there, um, you know, you could be talking about an investigation that involves dozens of subjects over a period of years. Uh, that could be a 40 to 50 page investigation report, but Wiru has essentially populated all of the relevant data into the report for you. Um, it comes out as a docx ready for the investigator to review. So really, really importantly, um, <clears throat> Wiru doesn't robo dead anyone. So for anyone who's overseas, it was a government thing that happened where AIs were basically shooting off uh, damaging things to people. Wiru doesn't do this. Wiru just hands you a mostly complete investigation report as an investigator. And from there, it might take you an hour or two just to roll through it, decide, I want to keep, I want to take, this is a bit too marginal, I'll take that out. Oh, the student told me something that explains that I don't need it. Or I want to add something extra here, or I want to add something extra there. Um, so using the old fashioned, pretty manual style of investigation, if you were doing a multi-subject investigation, let's say you've got 12 subjects for a student that you're concerned about, that process probably would have taken weeks just to produce your investigation um, report. Here you can go from your raw data to something that you've reviewed and are satisfied with inside a couple of hours. So it, this is where we hit that scalability um, uh, side of things. It means that that issue we were talking about of, well, you can't really, it's very difficult to provide proper objective data about how much cheating is going on when you're under-resourced. By tackling things this way through non-learning analytics and the Wiru tool, so to clarify here, Wiru is something I've built um, that I've coded. Um, <clears throat> what it has allowed us to do is massively scale up what we can objectively say is true and really try and use that as a spear tip to look for the kinds of changes we want, which are ultimately to do with assessment validity. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so thank you very much there. I'll hand back to Kane.
Thanks, Sean. Um, just about to wrap up, but just wanted to kind of finish by saying that attempting to fix the general problem we have, we don't just have a contract cheating problem, we have a broader assessment problem. And I'm sure everyone here today is perfectly aware of that. But just as contract cheating is a non-learning problem, so is AI. And that's, I think, the deeper problem that people are seeing. It's not cheating. It's, it can't necessarily be responded to with a cheating kind of framework. But what this should drive us to think about is how we go about securing assessment, where we secure assessment, whether we need to assess as much as we do. But regardless of the approach, like I don't think that um, any approach that isn't data-based, holistic and integrated will be anything but a exercise in futility. And so I guess what we're saying is you can't guess your way to success when it comes to assessment, security and validity. You need to know what you're dealing with. So thank you all very much. Very happy to take questions. Over to you, Matt. Yep. So, folks, you've got choices. You may type your question into the text chat or you may raise your virtual hand using the hands up symbol in the bottom middle of the screen. And therefore, you'll be able to ask your question via your microphone. So which would you like? Uh, okay, I've got so a question there from Rena asking why we call it non-learning analytics. <clears throat> that's a, that's a, an interesting question. It, it's, it's really just to emphasize the different mode of thinking when comparing it to learning analytics. So in think non-learning analytics as a concept is about a particular kind of decision-making threshold. So what I mean there is that generally speaking, if you're doing an investigation trying to decide if a student is responsible ultimately of, of creating a facade of learning, so academic misconduct of some kind, you need to reach a balance of probabilities decision about that. One way of looking at that is you start with an assumption that the student is engaging in learning unassisted. And then you see if the non-learning analytics pile up enough stones where you can reject that assumption to a balance of probability standard. So that's why it's non-learning analytics. It's kind of, it, it, it's a close relation of learning analytics. It's just sort of inside out in terms of the way it thinks about things, if that makes sense. Holly had a question. What insights relating to assessment type of design did you find? Um, I think this probably should inform um, the general approach is that we've had kind of teaching and you go away and do an assessment, then you come back and it's marked. Um, I think the types of activities that we get students to do, let's say an essay in history, uh, as a former historian and someone who studied history, obviously writing like that was actually very important to understanding how to be that. Um, it's not something that you can just replace with something else, but it's really about how we go about testing the learning outcomes and what those learning outcomes are. So having an essay as an actual assessable item really is kind of, I'd say, fatally wounded, um, as is things like forums, forum posts, uninvigilated quizzes, these types of things. But I, I suggest that we should be going, okay, to students, even in one subject, um, our mutual, our former colleague and our mate, Kate Ellis, designed a unit so that students did activities, they did quizzes, they did assessments, like, you know, essay writing and things, but she also put in a hurdle at the end instead of an exam. And so that became the thing where she got to test their learning with them. And I think that type of model in the absence of more formal um, programmatic assessment is probably something to look to. So designing the learning activities in a way that if a student learns, you can actually test them and how those things interrelate is probably a pretty important consideration. Priska also asked a question, does it focus on use of AI and plagiarism, not AI and not plagiarism currently like we could, but we, again, we don't really think it's cheating. We think we should 
disincentivize things like plagiarism or even AI use. If writing an essay helps a student with AI, helps a student learn, great. Um, as long as we can test that in another way that doesn't involve just handing in an essay. Yeah, I think the other thing too is that, um, especially when you're thinking about copy and paste types of of of, <clears throat> of, of plagiarism, for want of a better term, um, the I think a key thing to think about here is while it is the reality that probably every institution has more than a handful of students who are outright outsourcing many, many subjects over years to third parties. You've got to wonder about the spend of your institutional's, uh, institutional resources if you're getting focused on a bit of copy paste here and there. Um, there's clearly more important stuff going on. <laughs> and that's really what we try and focus on here, which is really dealing with probably stuff that's at the most serious end that's very seriously under addressed at this point. I'm just trying to respond to a question here in, in the chat. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask? And so Mark's asked limitations of what types of in, or instances of contract cheating does it does it not really detect? So it, it's it's really focused probably on the, the the dominant commercial contract cheating model, which is <clears throat> where a student hands over their their login credentials to a third party. The third parties lean on students and insist that they hand them over um, quite a bit for, for quite a few reasons that's probably would take a really long time to really get through explaining but um, so it's focused on that um, in terms of what it's not focused on right now Kane mentioned generative AI um, I'm generative uh, treating generative AI as an integrity problem in in my opinion is a is a bit of a no through road um, I, I I think um, it's an assessment design challenge, really, at this point, thinking about generative AI. Um, it also, as well, doesn't do stuff like, you know, if you're, you know, your dad sits at your computer and writes your assignment for you, it probably won't pick up that anything strange has happened there because it doesn't involve wholesale different connection behavior going on. But there definitely is enough of the type of commercial contract cheating we're talking about to be interesting. Um, you know, the, there's, the data we've seen is pretty strongly in line with that 10-ish percent figure or higher. Um, and, you know, we have seen individual subjects we've looked at where the, the uh, rate is much, much higher than that. Um, yeah, so there's, there's plenty to work with. <laughs> you, if you started working this way, you'll definitely find enough to keep a team very, very busy. We can promise that. <laughs> yeah. Let me just follow up on Amanda's question here. When you implemented this at your institution, did you need to get it past the student organisation? Um, no, no. Um, I think students have rights and we should respect them. Um, but I don't think students should be telling us how to secure assessment. I think we should seek their consent to doing certain things. So tell them that we will be analysing data. Absolutely. Yes. So from that perspective, we get consent. But no, we didn't run it through the student council or something like that. No. Because I don't think that's their place, to be perfectly honest. And um, I, I think as well, I mean, it's generally as a part of the boilerplate agreement of entering into a, an arrangement of being a student with an institution is that your data is visible to the institution. Um, that's part and parcel of things. Institutions have multi-factor authentic authentication, for example, when people are logging in and logging out. And that is all an automated process of doing similar kinds of things. <clears throat> so, you know, th those things are, are, are agreed to. It's probably not a bad thing to more explicitly let people know that this sort of thing can be done um, but uh, it, it's not something that necessarily requires more permissions than than already exist in most universities arrangements um, agreements with their students yep. rena had a question have you come across a situation where courageous conversations may have failed absolutely absolutely um, we, we can put every incentive give every incentive to a student and still they can choose otherwise 
to engage or not. Um, what interestingly, like when we first brought it in at UNSW, where um, David House and I created it, um, it was for lower scale, lesser scale matters than we deal with now. Um, we found for simple kind of one issue matters, it's incredibly effective, really, really high admission rates. Um, as you get into the, I'll go beyond severe or more severe and say most severe, once you go into those kind of matters, um, even if we're taking off the table in a courageous conversation, some of the worst possible outcomes, like getting kicked out of uni and things like that, um, it still might involve or imply failing quite a number of subjects. And so the, you know, the financial kind of cost there, their, their parents' reaction, um, just even the idea that the way they had their life planned up until the day we emailed them um, isn't going to happen can put real, it, it can hold them back from engaging in a courageous conversation. Um, it's one thing that I said to the team just in our team meeting this week that our, our work's really hard. Um, we deal with complaints as well, which I'm sure you can imagine is wonderful fun. Um, so it can kind of wear you down sometimes. And so I said to the team, let's all try to be conscious when we're, it's easier when you're talking to a student, it's, it's, you have to be more conscious of it when you're writing to a student to just radiate kindness. We can still deliver facts. We can still include every message we actually need to send. Um, but we don't have to, well, we want to consciously strip out kind of language, which might give them an impression that we don't care because we do. Um, so I think it's really important. And interestingly enough, we've had some very, very big admissions recently. It's, it kind of seems like once one student did it, others started rolling out of a cluster we're dealing with. Um, and so, and students talk. And so I think having, being able to push through and when they're all, when a whole bunch of students in a row deny the big ones, um, holding up hope and faith for that student who goes, yeah, I'm going to take the different road. I, I think a key thing to add there too on, on, on Kane's emphasis around radiating kindness is changing the way Insti I mean, it's an institutional change that takes time to achieve, but I don't necessarily think that the strongly moralized approaches to responding to integrity um, are necessarily useful to anyone. Um, instead of saying, you know, you have breached integrity rules and that's bad and we're going to punish you because you did the bad thing. <clears throat> I, I think the non-learning analytics approach facilitates a very different way of looking at this which is to say, look, based on the data we have, we're not very confident that you have done the learning yourself. Um, and because we're ultimately in the, in the business of assuring learning, we can't assure your learning here. Um, to, you know, to our decision-making standard, we can't assure that learning has happened in your subject. And because it hasn't happened, we can't give you a grade. And that's, that's all there is to it. There's no moralizing involved. I'm not punishing you because you were a naughty person. I'm pointing out that we can't assure that learning happened and learning assurance is really what we do all day as people who work in education. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you know, some people may say it's a semantic difference to some extent, but I, I don't think it is. I think there's a philosophically important difference and we see some, some of the, the, the fruits of taking different approaches to this in our responses from students, especially where they do provide a very large forthright admission to a matter that might involve many subjects over many years. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not excitement or, you know, anything like that you feel when a student does this. It's it's difficult to describe when a student does this it, because our work is almost by definition 
somewhat oppositional. We don't get to have that feeling very often like educators do that um, I got through to that student. And even in this difficult situation, um, they wanted to do this with me. And so it's very rewarding from that perspective. Um, the simpler ones, funnily enough, the simpler matters where students just straight up admit, they're also incredibly, um, trying to think of the word and it's not coming to me, but gracious, gracious. Um, they so thankful that we didn't just stop them. Um, and that makes us thankful that we didn't stop them and never wanted to. Um, it's just kind of, it's a correction or like grabbing someone's arm as they're just about to run in front of a bus. One might hope anyway. Yeah, Liz, the disappointment, you, we have to hang on to those who choose a different path and accept the disappointment for those who didn't. <clears throat> I'd, I'd spotted a question in there from <clears throat> Mark about, do we see a greater prevalence based on a particular demographic? It, it, it's something that I want to respond to very carefully. Um, <clears throat> I, I think one of the strengths of, of an approach like the one we're taking, which is a data driven objective kind of approach, is that this approach doesn't actually care where a student comes from or you know what their passport is or what their status is. It does, we've had matters that have involved domestic students and international students. <clears throat> but I think the kinds of situations that international students find themselves in that is admission to an institution where their chances of success might be low sometimes, does back them into corners at times, particularly where English isn't their first language, where they seek the help of, of people who present themselves as tutors or other kind of sneaky, insidious paths um, to offering cheating services. And, you know, the student takes them up on it. And next thing they know, they haven't really done any proper learning in first year and now they're in second year and there's no way they can catch up and on it goes. And so there is a certain lean toward that kind of thing. And the way I think institutions ought to respond to that data, again, much like with um, much like when you do non-learning analytics kind of work, you, you pick up that there are particular assessments that have security issues that really need to be dealt with. You may pick up recurrent issues around the way students come into and move through the university that might need dealing with, that are to do with support, that are to do with, um, uh, you know, the way we assess whether people are ready for entry and a number of other things. It's all data and, you know, it's useful in that regard. Anyone else? Did we miss any questions? Is there any that we didn't answer? There was a lot of messages in there and they kind of flew by as we were talking. So Martin's asked, what impacts have we seen? Uh, one. Oh, um, hello. Hang on. Oh, well, sorry. Go on. Yeah. Um, Frank has another one, which I'll address after. Sorry. Yeah. Very quickly, Martin, what impacts have we seen? I did a really great little piece of work with Kath Ellis where we, Kath, uh, essentially, you know, she, I mentioned before that one thing you can do with this approach is you can actually look to measure whether assessment changes you've made have made an impact. And <clears throat> that's a piece of work Kath and I did where she redesigned some assessment. Um, uh, and it was very secure the way she assessed it. It involved a really interesting bit of interactive oral assessment and you pretty much couldn't get through the subject without doing that. Um, <clears throat> and we noticed that quite a few students sort of popped out and withdrew early on. Um, uh, that the, other than that, the, the co when I analyzed the cohort, they all looked really good. Looked like a really good, clean cohort. We had a closer look at the students who left the subject though, and they were above average for risk behavior. <clears throat> so that was very interesting. So this was a means of us to actually look at an assessment change that was made and say, we can actually see the effect this has had. It's had the effect of 
getting people who are inclined to take risk behaviors and moving them off to other subjects, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> what, it, what that can mean then is that you may be able to shore up a whole program using programmatic assessment in that way. That means they've got to pick a new program now if they don't want to do the right thing. If your whole university gets good at this, they need to pick a whole uni now, right? So there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do um, through actually measuring the impacts of assessment change, which is really cool. Uh, I'm sure everyone has to go soon, especially those in the morning and those cooking dinner. But Frank had a question. Um, he asked, what is your take on spending much more time and effort on preventing cheating, both in informing students what is expected and redesigning the assessment? We think do both. And um, Nadia below said it too. Like, I don't actually think it's a choice. Um, like, Digital Link is permanent. And one day someone has to look at this and if we don't clean up our backyard we will have a very significant social license problem because the public won't believe us anymore when we say we're doing well um so i think absolutely there's a i think it's more than assessment design people talk about assessment design as if i just do this thing in my subject it's changing assessment across the whole of courses whole of degree programs and linking all those learning outcomes together in a way that they probably aren't now. Um, but in the meantime, we do have a cheating problem. And so, as I said earlier, it is about identifying and mitigating risk rather than letting it um, kind of go unchecked in the dark. And frankly, the reason why we're finding the stuff that we find now is because it has been left unchecked. That is the reason that no one's ever taken these efforts to actually try to identify it well at least not in ways that were helpful um and that's partly a, a a kind of senior leader funding problem like this could have been done but people haven't done it again i won't um kind of hypothesize as to why they might not have done it let's not be too cynical folks trying to see if there's any other questions. Thanks, Frank. What so percentage? It certainly hit a, a hot button issue here. A um, lot of discussion in the text chat. Um, so folks, and we've shared quite a few links as we've gone as well. Um, yep, the next session coming up in April is still to be confirmed, but it will happen. Um, if you would like to go back to slides, if you want to contact uh, Sean or um, uh, Kane, the, you can get access to them via Twitter as well. Um, and uh, Kane has got a very interesting personal blog that he likes to write. <laughs> so get onto that one, folks. It's, um, it's not so much liking to write as feeling compelled <laughs> to write by just having to get these ideas out of my head. Yeah, no. I I somewhere. I enjoy reading it in the sense that it's it's you know it, it's good to have a edgy thought put on paper out there that's you know coming from somebody who knows his stuff I must say um, so thanks for this uh, we are at 7 p.m. in Sydney so thank you very much for joining us um, the session will be re is recorded and will be online after this after the um maybe a couple of hours i'll get around to putting it up there after i've had some dessert had an early dinner <laughs> hopefully you folks are off to have some <laughs> have something to eat or have your breakfast or you're probably off to work if you're in the uk so thanks very much and see you again next month folks thanks all cheers <laughs>